Hi, I'm Dr. Carol Strip Whitney, and I am founder of Gifted Services of Ohio. I'm Julianne Ash. I'm the director of Midwest Educational Therapy and Associates, also in Ohio. And we both have um, worked together, played together, worked with kids together for a very long time, and we care about your kids. So much of our work is you can find in books. They're available on Amazon. Um, we'll move right on and start talking about the child. Who is the gifted child in the home and in the school? Most people have some confusion about the difference between a smart child and a gifted child. But Carol's book, Helping Gifted Children Soar, has some great charts in it that'll help you tell the difference. Smart children normally are able to get past upsetting issues. Talk to them, oh, I understand, and they settle down. A gifted child, because of their heightened sensitivities, can oftentimes explode and not get past it. The overwhelmed feeling might take even days to overcome. Their executive functions are different, so consequently, they can't down-regulate those emotions. So a smart child often uh, becomes uh, tuned in to um, other people and they take relationships as they come. They just, this is going to happen and then this is going to happen. Whereas a gifted child, especially highly gifted, becomes so intense that sometimes they just can't handle uh, situations that between, uh, with, when there's excitement, they get over. And other children don't know how to respond to that intensity they feel overwhelmed and will tend to back away. Very often smart children will work in a, con as they say, convergent, linear fashion where they go from one step to the other. A gifted, truly gifted child oftentimes reverses. They start with the end because their brain went there, so they go backwards. They call it reverse engineering, or they simply skim through things very quickly and have trouble explaining what they did. They've sponged it in, but when they stored it, their executive functions haven't worked to be able to retrieve it. Big, important point. Smart children normally finish, <laughs> or we hope they're gonna finish projects. You may have a very gifted child with, as one mom told me, has a lot of goose eggs, which means a lot of missing assignments. These can happen with extremely bright kids because they are so exact in their head that they want to, um, use the time more or less for themselves and what they're thinking about rather than all the steps in what they need to do to turn it in. They're lost. Well, and additionally, a lot of these students already know it and they don't see any reason to turn it in, especially if it's a dull, boring, repetitive type of an assignment. A smart child often gathers facts and they relate to a task and everything just goes step by step. Whereas um, gifted children often see the cause and effect and the relationships and they can predict new and interesting outcomes. Smart children also achieve, we hope, we hope they all achieve okay. and what we do is to try to um, give them the tools in, in educational therapy so they will achieve but a smart child is going to enjoy their accomplishments. Things come in a step-by-step -step manner, where a gifted child may be very dissatisfied with the way things are going. They have to have time to either argue about it or talk about the, the things that, they, that weren't right in the situation. And our gifted children are oftentimes perfectionistic, wouldn't you say, Carol? Oh, It's very never much. quite good never enough, because what's in their head didn't come out on the paper. A smart child understands reasoning with what's fair. <laughs> when, a, when a teacher says, look, this is what happened, this is a consequence, a highly gifted child may say, it's not fair. Ethics are very important to gifted children. So do gifted children feel stress at a higher level? Well, the answer is? Yes. Very much. Very much so. And why, why is that? There's actually scientifically a difference in the way the brain is formed. A gifted child is going to have more neurons biochemically 
they're wired differently. The synapsis happens much more rapidly. The thinking part of their brain thickens more quickly and they, and they just process quickly. They have more gray matter. The neural impulses pass from neuron to neuron much more quickly and the uh, synapses are faster for their thinking. How, why do they feel out of sync? Besides the fact that they're, that they're thinking things that others aren't. One of the things too is a lot of these students, if you look at their intelligence level, you're seeing that they're at the 99th percentile. That means out of 100 children, 99 were at or below. So really, when you look at them, they really are out of sync in some respects because they don't have true peers. So you may have heard of the term asynchronicity. It's been around now maybe 20 years, basically meaning they are out of sync. They're out of sync with themselves. It's a trait that defines it, that defines giftedness. Um, and an example would be, and we talked about a young man that plays the violin very well, but he got to a point where his brain told him what he should be playing, but his hands couldn't make the stretch. So this is often how a gifted child feels. They are very intense, like a sponge, and definitely susceptible to overexcitability. The amygdala is actually larger. And for those of you that might be unfamiliar with the amygdala, it's a small organ in the middle of the brain that actually helps manage our fight, flight, or freeze activity. You can think of it as the brain's bodyguard. It's really good. Reinforces the, the content of memory, uh, the asynchronicity sense, because of that, gifted kids send messages to the reactive brain when they're under stress. That's a part that that's, um, they just can't get out of. And the prefrontal cortex depends on, develops slower. And the prefrontal cortex is what helps Front. down regulate this frontal part. It's developing more slowly. It's not sending the same level, intensity, and amount of settle down signals to that amygdala as you'd see in a neurotypical child. So how do these differences impact stress level? Everything that the brain <laughs> transmits for the gifted is heightened. As some people say, you can think of the child with little antennas all over their body. Those little hairs stand up straight and they're like little wires that, that go right straight to the amygdala. So how do we define stress? These yeah. are the common understandings. Emotional, Emotional or physical tension. Any event where you're frustrated, angry, upset. Stress is the body's reaction to a challenge. Unfortunately, the amygdala can't tell the difference between a test and a tiger. Uh, stress is the body's reaction to challenge when they're all of a sudden something's put upon them. There's a like a, a mom saying, what happened to this you were supposed to do <laughs> yeah an instant stress and the stress is the demand that is putting on the system just the whole body is feeling it so stress is heightened because gifted children are capable of synthesizing so much in their brain if you're familiar with bloom's taxonomy they work at the higher levels the analysis synthesis and evaluate and evaluation levels so that's pretty intense and it's just going on all the time and they're taking in at all it's the associative thinking that comes in like a sponge everything at once right and the associative thinking when you sponge it in like that on the executive functions aren't robust so it's not being broken down and stored in categories you get that what we call tip of the tongue it's in there but i can't get can't my get hands on another additional another stressor stressor so first, we're going to give you a little information for, for those of you who teach. Of course, we all teach. And <laughs> now we're doing teaching, more teaching with all of our kids at home. More. But we, with all of this, the more we understand, the better we can be. We need to understand. For a teacher, obviously, we want our children, our gifted children, to go deeper, not more. We don't say, because you're gifted, let's see, everybody else did 15, you have 25. That is not, that just punishes the gifted child. What we want is to get into their interests and their passions and help them go to a deeper level, independently, if possible. Um, we want them to work together when they can. They 
feed off each other, just like we do. <laughs> well, and remember what we were saying, they're a very small portion of a population. So this is part of being able to build and maintain relationships and interests with peers. Okay. Make sure gifted students are yeah. not punished with more work, as we said. Uh, replace the grade level curriculum with what is actually pertinent to the child. It can be done. I've taught it. I've had graduate teachers say, I believe in it all, but I have had one curriculum I don't really know. There are the, the tiering and the scaffolding can help us find levels and plug kids in. We're not teaching um, subject matter, we're teaching children. Well, and additionally, when you're talking about this, teachers say, well, how do I do that? There are many resources, um, like the Northwestern University, yes. uh, uh, Brigham Virginia. Young University has a, a program of online where, where students who are need that challenge, because what's critical in terms of stress management later in their life and executive function is if they're not appropriately challenged, they develop the habit of thinking everything should be easy. And all of a sudden, if it's no longer easy, then they okay. think that they're not smart anymore. And many of them, wouldn't you agree, Carol, yes. give up. Yes. They, 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 well, we lose them. We lose them. Yep. We need, as teachers, we need to allow time for gifted students to just explore, not just everything paraphrased and, you know, this is it, this is it, but allow, after they've done it, then give them those moments to expand, to think, to reflect, to put things together. And I know and more. Quickly. And I know more about red-tailed boa constrictors than I ever <laughs> wanted to learn from a very a talented young gifted gentleman child. who was a budding herpetologist. So encourage the independence, the research, coming, finding that thing. When you get a gifted kid on a topic that they love, just oh. get out of the way. <laughs> Just get out of the way and encourage them. So we, we try to reduce the lecture time. I know with Common Core, you know, teachers tell me every day, there's so much we have to cover, so much, but somehow find your strategies for yourself to allow kids to have some think time so it's not all programmed for them. So how do we do it? Teacher orchestrates the curriculum to match the levels. And, and it, within your class, have those flexible groups going on. So, so children are with like peers part of the time. This can be done through a variety of methods, educational options, acceleration. You don't have to go a whole grade level to accelerate. You can do it on a subject content area. So let's say you're really great at math and you need to be one or two grade levels above for that period of the day, you visit that class. Montessori does that normally with their three grade groupings where a child may be at fifth grade in reading but seventh grade in math. Right. And it, it's a natural piece and it also <laughs> maintains that social because part of that asynchronicity is they don't really uh, connect to their, their peers, and then if you accelerate them too far, they are way out of synchronicity with right. much more with mature, emotional, emotional and so social. A lot to, to consider. Mm -hmm. Cluster grouping has been used very successfully in a lot of places where, let's say you have five fifth grades, and you have six really high math students among all of the classes. You figure out a way those students can meet in one space for their instructional time as well as their work time. And maybe if you're doing it more virtually, what you might try to do is see if you could have a mini Zoom group, Zoom group doing that it. would be doing that way. Zoom Curriculum group. compacting is a way simply of getting rid of what of all the extra things that are not necessary for the level that the child's at. If it's extra, you get it out and you take them where they are and do what's important to the child in their group. And for parents, it would be you would pretest. Don't go over what they already know. Just go ahead and start with your new stuff. And when, as parents, as teachers, when we talk to our children, they're, they're gifted children are little small grown ups. They are very capable of having adult conversations on topics that they know a lot about. So we need to work on our questions so it's a higher level and elicits a, a higher response, not just knowledge and comprehension, but instead 
what do you think and what's your opinion? And in this respect too, when teachers are working at a very literal, concrete level all the time, that's a source of stress. When it's sort of like driving a Maserati in first gear all the time, that puts a lot of stress on the engine. And this is a source of that. In the independent study, we've talked about giving them, it doesn't mean because you're gifted, you're on your own. They need as much support, maybe in some ways more because of the social emotional aspects, but they need opportunities to be independent with your guidance, your encouragement, and your, your uh, initiation to do that. Then uh, sometimes we pull out. There's programs that are not used quite as much unless the teacher becomes teacher of record. But if a, chi if a gifted group pulls out of other classes, the, if you're teacher of record, the child doesn't have to make up the group work when they come back because th that teacher is teacher of record and that is their class. And the other thing is oftentimes this is misunderstood. So for parents, your child does not, if your child's being pulled out for reading, they do not, and the teacher is teacher of record, they do not have to make up their reading class work. Right. And that oftentimes become a source of stress. Oh, very much mm -hmm. so. So in, uh, many schools have, and I'm sure in your home, you can develop a resource room where children have maybe centers and they can kind of get lost in some scientific experiments or a writing display. You might make a lower level of your home. Um, I have a dear friend who has her whole lower level in a like a uh, classroom and she has kids come over. Or Who's like my gentleman who is red-tailed boa constrictors, you don't want hog-nosed snakes because they're escape artists. <laughs> Uh, the tiered assignments just take the same lesson and look at ways, give the kids more like being in different groups. So if they're in a group of, of gifted students, you're not going to start with what is the name of. You're going to start with given what you know, bah, 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 and it's going to be at a higher level. Scaffolding is really a good way uh, to take the content beyond the original level where again, independence is allowed. You take the lesson, produce, uh, introduce it, and then later you come back to the ideas. So it's like a cognitive spiral. spiral. The other thing is too, for a lot of parents go, I, ah, scaffolding. It's really just mm -hmm. exactly what it says. But if you think of the five W's, who, what, where, when, why, and how, that will help give you sort of an automatic scaffold that you can use to introduce a subject. So now let's say you're a parent or teacher and you've been doing all these things and you say, oh, we did it, we did it, we did it. And maybe something isn't working for that child. And, child. and the schools will often say, oh, they're very smart, so they'll be fine. But if you are feeling yourself that your child is struggling, believe yourself. So this child has not responded to these options, all that we just talked about. So now you actually are, the child is unable to perform what you know their potential is what they're capable of. So what do parents, as parents, what do we do? Again, begin with understanding. Very basic things, but they're so, probably each thing is at a higher level for a gifted child. So we try to not threat, give threats. We try not to, to we try to give them daily goals and daily uh, opportunities for their choice. Like here are three things that mom wants you to do. You get to pick. And then, or maybe it's your time and then it's, then it's my time. Or maybe a third time where you can negotiate the time. And you work for always positive, always positive. You always want to work from the child's strengths, not from what they can't do. Because for our gifted students, they already oftentimes are perfectionistic and want to be in control. So they don't want to hear what they're doing wrong, but they thrive when they hear what they can do right. Very, very sensitive. Gifted kids, when they hear a critical, a critical comment, even though the parent or the teacher is trying to build, it's, it works the opposite. Because and heaven forbid it's sarcastic. Can't. Yes. Oh my gosh, that, that's a death, and death so, knell. So as parents, to help them with the emotions, just how to relax, how to look on. It's not the end of the world, even though they're saying that it is. One of the things for the relaxation therapy, there's uh, two very good ones. There's a number of apps out there 
There is nice music to put in the background like calm radio. Additionally, a very effective one is called box breathing. Mm -hmm. And you might want to take a look at that on the web because kids enjoy it and it's a great thing for the parent too. So we also want relevant and co coherent family activities, things that make sense. And again, letting your child, obviously they have to be of age, make some of the choices for the family and then give feedback on how it's doing because we want them always to be reflective, but we want it to go in a positive direction and you can model that. One, model of, the things, you... one of the things with that is parents say, well, how, I was never given proper feedback. How can I do this to my child? Try the technique of what helped you, where was it good in a similar situation, and then what blocked you. Because then it's not a judgment, it's not a value. Now you're looking at the concrete, what helped, what blocked. Real good. So yourself, as much as possible, stay relaxed. <laughs> Perfectionism is very common in gifted students. We want them to work on that. And this is how you might feel mom or dad in the middle of a, of a job when this child has done this kind of process and you're saying, I really don't think and also, teacher meant that much. Yeah, also too, oftentimes gifted children have gifted parents. So this may also trigger your own perfectionism. So other ways, just appreciate the trait. Perfectionism can be good. Help the child see it, see that and understand that it's, it does serve a good purpose. It's a driver, it's, it can be a motivator, Definitely. but there's a difference between pursuit of excellent and perfectionism. Perfectionism is never good enough, but it can be harnessed as pursuit of excellence. Very good, yes. So perfectionism does not have to be everything. Help, help our children understand, let's just do this one thing and, and work and work and work. I think it's the outliers or what's the book that um, goes on about how often you, how many hours you have to put into something to become an expert and help them. The word is practice. Just practice. If we practice, we will, we will we'll, gain. We'll gain, right. So, and then maintain high standards for yourself, but don't put those on your child. They're going to notice it anyway. But just because you're good at something, you don't want them to, you don't want to become a tyrant to them because you're beyond them. And also remember, there's no one who is perfectly good at everything. Yes. Even highly, profoundly gifted oh, individuals sure. will have areas that they're not as good at. But unfortunately, our children seem to think, if I'm good and gifted in one area, I have to be gifted in and, all areas. And they, when they sort that out, you see a big difference. So just keep them striving. When the, tough, when the times get tough, just next step. You know, I may stumble, I won't fall. Model what you want. Don't punish them for the things that happen. Help them learn to hold on to their ideals and that they can reach them, that the whole world didn't happen in one day. We're just gonna take it one step at a time. And really important, have fun. Have fun with learning. Have fun with your family. Enjoy them. Sometimes our strategies are not working even when parents are doing all these things. So we go to something called, you may, hopefully you've heard of, if you've not, educational therapy. That's what we're all about, executive function. So what is it? It's the processes where we're guiding, directing, managing, and it's managing the cognitive, it's managing the emotional, like the amygdala, and of course, the two combined give you the behavioral Behavior. functions. So the executive function is a toolbox and we use it by building strengths for the, the children to perform the actions that are positively directed. And we help with self-control, goal-directed behavior. We want to maximize our outcomes without beating ourselves up. We might think of it as the conductor of the symphony orchestra. It's the executive function, the prefrontal cortex that's, that controls everything we do. So if we get it under control, we can make our lives flow together. And as I tell the student, you can learn to drive your own brain. Yes, that's a good one. So it well, works off strategies. So what is the strategy? Any instructional act or any construct that helps them overcome a difficulty to find success. And what's key, 
is that they're based in the individual strengths. Correct. Not in what they can't do. So it is, we have four big categories. First, we have initiation. Now, you may see your child in any one of these or combination thereof. Initiation. You, whether it's getting started right. or getting restarted when you're stuck. Right. That's what we That's see a, a lot with one. gifted children. And planning. How to look ahead, figure out the steps in order to get there. Because for many of them, it's just one big thing that all happens at once. And if you remember for planning, they're associative thinkers. So they brought it all been given chunks. They don't know how to break it up. Organization of materials. By the way, this is an actual picture from a student of mine's bedroom. And it all fits together with time management because if, they, if we help them see with multiple strategies, see what is happening time-wise, all these things start to work better together. So here are strategies for initiation. So initiation <clears throat> helps us get started on some, it's how we begin a task or independently generate ideas for tasks. When children are stressed, they really frequently will have trouble with initiation because it looks too big. Uh, they're stalled out, they can't get going, and we have a neurologically driven one and more of an anxiety driven one. Yep. The neurological is like, there is no start button. It, I mean, some of our 2E students, for whatever reason, they their the wiring is difficult for them. That's be, they can't even find where to start. Effective strategies, both at home and school, bullet point the directions, give them the start point. Partially complete graphic organizers so that they don't feel so overwhelmed. Right. Samples is huge. Another side piece in voice to text software you will be able to generate information at least 40% faster compared to handwritten. And for a lot of students, they will actually can't get started because it looks too big, but once it's voice to text or pair them with a buddy, but you need to be careful that they don't become buddy reliant. Okay. okay. So now for planning. We had, we right? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Strategies for planning. That's anticipating, setting goals, step-by-step -step approach to tasks. I'm sure we've all heard it's today. Oh, it's due today. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, it's Sunday and it's, Mom, I got to go to the store so I can get some stuff for Monday. They seem to live in eternal mm. now. So for an individual who's a neurotypical student, they have a sense of the past. They have a sense of the future. Dr. Russell Barkley calls it a time event horizon. This is our guys where they have trouble with executive function, okay? And part of it is the answer to that is layer reminders. Whoops. Oh, yep, there it is. Okay. Uh, make time visual. That's a huge one. Be able to see what the time is, looks like passing. One of the things of pet peeve is we're now going to digital clocks for young children. Analog clocks would allow them to see time passing. They lose that sense of time. Visual calendars, color coding, especially on websites, electronic okay, reminders, today. cell phones, emails, text yourself, personal time, multiply. Now, the thing is, I'm just going to come back here. A lot of parents are concerned about the use of electronics. Um, take a look at your distraction management apps. There's quite a few of them out there for all platforms. It's well worth the investment. The personal time management is a fun one. Multiplier. Yep. It's you ask them to guess how long it's going to take and then they time it to see and over a period of time. And one of my engineering students figured out they were 2.79 times all effective strategies. You can layer reminders, look ahead, provide lists of upcoming topics, sample project breakdowns. Parents can do this at home. So strategies for organization of materials, and you and we do, we've talked about organization and planning being very different things. For the organization, think of your child in his room and if all the clutter that might be there, if, we, if you can help him, not you do it, but help him see, I would like to organize my desk here and have have a place for everything remember that is going to help him greatly think and, about developing an education station yes and put homework in the, these are organizational materials put homework in the front of a binder 
if, at the end of the day, if it, especially middle school and high school kids are throwing things in their backpack, if they just use that, that plastic front and they know when they go home, they have the security, everything I have to do tonight is right there. They don't have to worry about, you know, all of this clutter. Uh, and then of course, online books really help. Right. And the thing is you want one place and to give people time for organization. Put that in right as part of it. One, their own way to organize and remember to organize, that's huge. A lot of times they don't remember they have something to remember. Now strategies for time itself. Right, this is a huge one. It's two axes. This is time-based, urgent for half an hour to 48, less urgent. And this axis is how it impacts you, important to less important. So what you would do first is make a list of tasks and put it beside the matrix. Assess it, put the matrix results. When you're done, put them on some sort of a calendar or system reminder. So we have to remember all of the areas that we've talked about are influenced by time. Now, what about time and self-management for a twice exceptional child? Basically, we, we need to understand when did twice exceptional, when did that term begin? Is it new? Is it something that kids are doing today that they didn't used to do? They've probably always done it, but it was actually identified in the 1990s. And it basically means that a child has the giftedness and some sort of uh, disability, something that holds them back at the same time. So what might that be? It could be giftedness and dyslexia or or processing disorders, or obsessive compulsive, sensory processing, like autism or spectrum, uh, Tourette's, ADHD, anxiety, and, depression. And with anxiety and depression, that's going to decrease their processing speed Slows and their working memory, which is slowing it down. So now, many 2E students operate out of fear. They're already ultra sensitive, they already know that things aren't working the way they wish, and they're, they're fearful. And they don't understand how they, they're actually different than other kids for two reasons, because they're gifted, and then they have the disability. So if we can get ourselves inside how that child feels, we, our successes are gonna be greater. There's, they know something's wrong, but they're not sure how to talk about it. They, they um, benefit from many strategies and Educational therapy allows one-to-one -one therapy. And we can, it's brain-based, it can help bring success in the life for a 2E e student. These blocks are mainly focused, as we've been saying, in the frontal lobe, the, the executive function portion of the brain is uh, in, in the prefrontal cortex. And it, can, and it can be addressed through training. Right, so here's a study. I yep. did, I had two students, one who was neurotypically um, gifted, just came in, did normal things, uh, the way a lot of gifted kids do. Then I had one who was severely autistic and gifted at the same time. And the, the parents were most cooperative. I got my OSU comparative study of uh, benefits or they, they allowed it. So I would see one for an hour and then the other, and I took all of these strategies, these are just a few out of a zillion, but I had them keyword where they looked at an article and then they had to pick out what was important. I had them paraphrase where they had to load them from their memory and um, say, again, say back what they had learned. I had them do multiple choice questions where they had to again remember, and then a strategy called close where you white out certain words in a, in a, um, an article, Paragraph. and mm -hmm. then they have to, out of their brain, come up with a word that makes sense. Much more difficult than it sounds. So here's our, my first guy. Here's my second guy. This is what was similar between them. So my first one, over and over, he had difficulty with the spe specificity of what we did. He wanted specific terms, very detailed, very, very... Um, um, and Alex was the child with autism. Right. So you were seeing right. the rigidity and the very concrete aspect of the autism in with the 
giftedness. Right. So, and it, it never failed. He always did this. Whereas Alan, being more neurotypical, it doesn't mean it's better or worse. He just had a different way. He would often, he wasn't always sure of himself. Actually, they both were, I think because they knew they were part of a study, they acted as though they weren't sure. But um, Alan would often make a, a, take a risk and make a mistake. Whereas Alex, a lot of times, was just uptight. And not that's willing. a source of stress for individuals with autism because they tend to be very rule following. And so in this instance, it was another additional source of stress, even though it was supportive. And they both did well with the strategies, which shows as long as the strategies are consistent, meaningful, directed towards the areas that we're looking to improve, we're going to be successful. And we stay in the positive at all times. So the twice exceptional holds extra keywords, extremely literal, ethical for every detail. That's exactly what he, every detail. Needed transition time. Didn't mention that mm -hmm. before. Goes off topic to chat. Sometimes I thought it was just a way to relieve himself. Well, <laughs> relieve also to decrease the, some of the, the stress anxiety. and yes. anxiety. And um, had trouble with other person perspective. That was another one we did. If, if write this article from the perspective of the President of the United States or the President of a Congressman. That's and theory of mind. Very, very difficult for, for the uh, twice exceptional. Where the neurotypical did miss some key words, was not overly literal like the autistic, ethical, but not worried. He was absolutely worried. Uh, would, could move easily. We'd stop one thing and start another where the autism, it was got stuck on this thing and you had to give extra time. St the neurotypical stayed the course and did the other person, in fact, had a lot of fun with that. So they're just, they're just different strategies that need to be used for different reasons. So the neurotypical students often have organizational problems, even though they're not twice exceptional, they still have organization problems. And this is a wonderful book by, this, this was my publisher of three of the four books, Dr. Webb, with a, a whole group of scientists and, and doctors, absolutely has done a stellar job clarifying the differences of all these different diagnoses. And it's important to understand because sometimes those misdiagnoses will end up with a additional stress or waiting too long mm -hmm. to get the help or, or the assumption and lead to underachievement in what would truly be a gifted person, but it's being hidden by some of these good, other things. Really good point. So these strategies help the neurotypical as well as the twice exceptional. Where there's no, um, they all feel stress. It's just the degree to which they feel it. And in this case, we just look at the strategies and saying any gifted or any child really can get relief from the strategies in terms of stress and anxiety. So. Here we are. We want a successful child. We want potential to be at the level of, of their ability. We don't want them stressed, but at the same time, there's going to be some of that. And so then we give them a toolbox. And the toolbox is filled with all of these little tools that they pull out to use when they get in a, when they get in a problem. And when they're using their <laughs> tools, they're based in their strengths. Right. So the anxiety will go down the stress level will go down. It's a way of quieting the amygdala and being able to bring up the processing speed so the child can actually show what they know. So you may or may not have seen the um, movie, Mr. Holland's o Opus, but the, in this is a very gifted young lady, the redhead, who goes into Richard Dreyfus and says, I'm done, I'm not gonna play the clarinet anymore, it's over, and squawks. And so she closes it up and leaves and he says, come back, I need, I need you. And, and he says, see me in the office at eight tomorrow. So she comes back and he says to her, what do you like about yourself? This is what educational therapy does for kids. She says, well, she couldn't think of anything she liked, but she said, my dad likes my hair, my red hair, and says it reminds him of the sunset. So he calmly says, then play the sunset. She plays it much more beautifully than she did before. So we hope you find your sunset. We hope that some of these ideas have helped you with your child 
in your classroom, in your home, in your family. That was a sunset that I had just recently, and I hope you find you, you can celebrate your own. So thank you so much. And again, if you would like some additional information, take a look at Dr. Carol's books. Also, we have a YouTube channel and I have a Facebook under Midwest Educational Therapists and Associates. We both of us we both have welcome, websites. both of us welcome uh, information, questions from parents, teachers, and stakeholders in our children's lives. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks for watching our presentation. Um, I'm Dr. Carol Strip Whitney. I did many years of gifted education, started the Dublin Gifted Program for 15 years, was recruited to Olentangy where I built their program for another 17 years. Prior to that, taught all of the grades, K through eight, and spent time with the counselors in the high school. I've written the four books that you saw on the screen. Um, but more important than anything, I love what I do. And I love building the potential in children and have a strong passion for giftedness. Did my doctorate at Ohio State University. Um, lo love it. Hi, thank you so much for attending our presentation. Dr. Carol and I really enjoy visiting with all of you and sharing our knowledge. I'm Julianne Ash. I'm a board certified educational therapist. There's about 109 of us worldwide. So it's a brand new way of looking at how people learn. We look at individual strengths and then take a look at the processes that help them learn how to learn. When we're looking at adolescents, children and adults at Midwest Educational Therapists, our therapy group, we try to individually tailor what they need in order to maximize their performance, help them embrace who they are in a positive message, and to be able to execute effectively and independently in the world based on their strengths. Thank you. We look forward to speaking with you. Thank you.